How are you enjoying our little trek with Paul? Anybody enjoying our little trek with Paul here in the book of Acts? Today's message, Arrival in Corinth. Last week, we looked at Paul's missionary journey into the province of Macedonia. He follows the Via Ignatia. You remember what the Via Ignatia is from last week? Anybody? The Roman military road, right? Yes, that goes through the top of Greece, right there, the red line that you see going along there. He follows the Via Ignatia to Philippi. Uh, You can see Philippi kind of in the middle of the road right there. He plants a church in Philippi. That's where he meets the, meets the famous Lydia. And then he's persecuted by some Jews who become jealous of him. And then he moves on to the next largest center, which was Thessalonica, where the same thing happens. Last week, we talked about Thessalonica and Berea. So you can see where Thessalonica is, a little more there to the left of Philippi. He leaves Thessalonica, and then he goes down to Berea. Now, you can't see Berea because it's a a smaller center. It is south-southwest of Thessalonica. So he starts to move down um, down Greece there to move south. So he ends up in Berea, south of there, where we ended last week. From Berea, the Jews came from Thessalonica, those who were jealous of him. They go all the way down to Berea. They persecute him in Berea. And so Paul leaves uh, Berea and goes to Athens, where he preaches at the famous school of philosophy, the Areopagus. And Athens is down the south. If you want to slide to the next slide for us there, uh, awesome. So Athens is down there on the right-hand side. So the top map of Greece there. It's a little fuzzy. It's hard to see. It goes all the way down. You see where Athens is to the south there, to the red of the dot? And the dot is actually where Corinth is. So he's, he's up there along the top by Thessalonica. He goes all the way down, a little bit south to, to Berea, and then he goes all the way down to Athens. And is in Athens where we hear the uh, famous story of Paul preaching at the Areopagus. Do you remember from last year, Paul at the Areopagus? Oh, thank you, Esther. I'm glad somebody remembered. Last year, we looked at the story of Paul in Athens where he preaches at the Areopagus, gives his famous speech there. So we are actually going to skip over Athens and we're going to move on to chapter 18. So Paul goes from Philippi to Thessalonica to Berea all the way down to Athens and then from Athens he goes to Corinth. Now Corinth was just down the road from Athens. Oh, you want to go back one more for me there, Cliff? Thanks. So at the bottom map there, on the right-hand side is Athens, and on the left over to the, to the other side where that isthmus is there, that's where Corinth is. So it's not very far, only about 83 kilometers. So Corinth is just down the road from Athens, 83 kilometers west. Corinth, very interesting city. It had been destroyed in 146 BC by Roman general Lucius. After too many rebellions against Rome, General Lucius raised it to the ground in 146 BC. Now, it remained that way until Julius Caesar, in 46 BC, refounded it as a Roman colony. And he did that because it had a strategic uh, and trade importance where it was located because it's on that isthmus. Uh, between the Saronic Gulf and the Gulf of Corinth. So down at the bottom there, there are two major seas there, one on the right and one on the left, which is hard to see. Uh, You can see where it opens up into a big sea there. So it was a very strategic location. So Julius Caesar rebuilds Corinth. Now Corinth, it ballooned into a bustling city of trade and commerce. It very quickly became the capital of the province of Achaia. Now, although Corinth had their philosophers and their poets, they did not have the schools of learning like Athens and Rome, Alexandria, and Tarsus. They did have something else that made them stand out in the Roman world. Anybody know what that was? What made Corinth stand out in the Roman world as a city? They had many intellectuals there, but that's not what made them stand out. (laughs) 
there was a mix there. Eventually, there was, oh, Franz, I love you. You, you know what? It's so great. You're, you're just way ahead of me here. <laughs> a few years down the road. But what made Corinth so famous in the Roman world was their, their temples. Yes, a lot of it was their temples. They were, they, they were very uh, pagan. They had a lot of religion there, a lot of worship, so lots of pagan temples. And along with those temples, they were famous for their Shipmaking. No, but, you know, they were good at it. <laughs> it was their promiscuity. It was their promiscuity, which was hand in hand with the temples and, and the religions, etc., and so on. <clears throat> yes, you are right. The Corinthians were famous for their promiscuity. Interestingly enough, Romans, they were known to be promiscuous. So to stand out as a promiscuous city in an already sexually liberal culture was quite the accomplishment, we'll say. <laughs> Corinth, with a booming economy, travelers and traders coming and going from all over the world. It was the capital of the province. It had political influence. You could say it was like the Roaring Twenties but of the first century for the city of Corinth. Just the kind of place that Paul likes to settle into and evangelize. Reading from Acts 18, verses 1 to 17. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. It was no surprise to see fellow Jews throughout Europe and Asia. It felt like home whenever Paul saw his fellow countrymen, especially when traveling so far from home. Perhaps it was an unconscious homesickness that drew Paul to the synagogue upon arrival to a new city. Or was it all practical? Was it a place just to establish connections and expound the scriptures? or a place to feel at home, or both. Paul had heard of two Jews who had come from Rome, folks of means who had traveled wild, widely, Aquila and Priscilla. They too were refugees of sorts. You see, in 49 AD, the emperor Claudius had expelled all the Jews from Rome over the issue of Crestus. You see, tensions between the Jews and Jewish Christians in Rome had reached riotous proportions. No wonder the city councils in Philippi, Thessalonica, and Berea were so cautious on dealing with this issue. Paul went to see them, and because he was a tent maker, as they were, he stayed and worked with them. Every Sabbath he reasoned in the synagogue, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. You know, it was so refreshing for Paul to have met not only fellow Jews, but fellow Christians. Aquila and Priscilla had been founder members of the Christian church in Rome, which made Paul feel all the more at home when he met them. Turns out that they were Jews of the diaspora as well, like Paul. They were from Pontus. It was a city on the shores of the Black Sea. So they had a lot in common with Paul. He was a Jew of the diaspora and grew up in Tarsus. It also turns out that Aquila and Priscilla were tent makers. So Paul joined them as it was his trade as well. And they prospered together while in Corinth. Saturday would come the Sabbath. And what would Paul do? Hmm? What would he do on the Sabbath? Go to the synagogue, exactly. Paul would go to the synagogue week after week, every Sabbath, showing them in the scriptures that the Messiah had to suffer, to die, and to rise again. It was a lot of work. The physical work of making tents from Sunday to Friday, teaching in the synagogues on Saturday, there wasn't much time for anything else, including rest. And when Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, 
testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. Ah, yes, it was so refreshing to have help in the ministry. Silas and Timothy, they had been held up in Berea. They were finally able to come and help Paul, who had called for them when he was in Athens. They finally catch up with him in Corinth, along with a generous financial gift from the church in Philippi. How we need each other to enable one another in getting the word out there. Paul was not able to pursue his first calling to teach and tell the message of Jesus Christ, which he did with great fervor as the resources enabled him. Silas and Timothy came with financial help from Philippi. So Paul was preaching Sabbath after Sabbath. But when they opposed Paul and became abusive, he shook out his clothes in protest and said to them, your blood be on your own heads. I'm innocent of it. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Then Paul left the synagogue and went next door to the house of Tidius Justus, a worshiper of God. Now Crispus, the synagogue leader, and his entire household, they believed in the Lord. And many of the Corinthians who heard Paul believed and were baptized. Hmm. You know something? It's one thing to disagree with somebody, and it's another to become abusive. You know a person is losing an argument, or they know that they're wrong when they have to resort to abusive language or anger or violence. There is no point in dealing with such people when they reach that point. They are beyond reason and have become dangerous. Get away from them and don't waste your time with them. So Paul has had it. He's had it with them. After the thousands of reasons, the scriptures which they could plainly see for themselves, they could read for themselves, it was outright denial of what was right in front of their faces. The prejudice of their traditions blinded them to the truth. It was the prejudice of their traditions which blinded them to the truth, and they refused to open their eyes. And Paul had seen this before. In order to protect the Jews, because he saw what was coming, in order to protect the Jews that did believe, he chose not to use the synagogue as his base for teaching anymore, and instead was welcomed to the home of Tidius Justus, a God-fearing Greek who kept his house very neat and tidy. Tidius Justus? Ah, oh, <laughs> took a second. <laughs> yes, Tidius Justus. He was a man of means as well. Very wealthy, very influential in Corinth. He was of good reputation, and he believed Paul's message. This helped the leader of the Jewish synagogue, Crispus, who had to deal with this group of Jews who were becoming more and more abusive towards Paul. So neither Crispus nor Paul wanted this to escalate into another Philippi, another Thessalonica, or another Berea. It was a wise solution. Just go to Titius and come to my place. Use it as your base for teaching. It was a good solution. And although that there were those who were causing a problem, you know, look at how many had come to believe and were baptized. But Paul himself was fed up. He'd had enough with these Jews. After seeing such incredible response from the Gentiles, he thought, why would I waste my time with the Jews anymore? That's it, thought Paul. I'm not having anything more to do with the Jews. I'm wasting my time, pearls before swine. I'm going where I'm wanted and welcome to the Gentiles. And who could blame him? You know what? I could just hear Aquila and Priscilla speaking words of comfort and wisdom to him. Now, Paul, you have every right to be angry. They've done terrible things to you. But don't forget all those who have believed your message. Don't forget us who as Jews have found incredible encouragement from you. Don't forget the eyes of so many you have opened, like Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, and his family. 
And don't forget all those Jews who believed in Philippi and Thessalonica. Don't forget the noble Jews of Berea. Hmm. It's nice to have wise words from a friend when we're discouraged, isn't it? Sure. And perhaps Paul himself was feeling quite burned out. Perhaps he hadn't fully recovered from the illness he had when he arrived in Corinth. As he writes in one of his letters, he says, You remember when I came to you in weakness and in sickness? Whatever it was, Paul had become discouraged, fed up, and burnt out. He was ready to move on, not just from the synagogue, but from Corinth. So one night, the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent, for I am with you, and no one is going to attack and harm you, because I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half, teaching them the word of God. Hmm. Even God knows when our spirits are down and we need an encouraging word from him. We may not see the impact our words are having, but God does. Paul felt like he was wasting his efforts. He was discouraged. He felt ineffective, like he was doing all this work for nothing. God sees what we do, and God saw what Paul was doing. You know what? We are so results-oriented, and it's natural. All of us are, and there's nothing wrong with that. If we weren't results-oriented, we would never improve. We would never fix problems. Our effectiveness would never increase. And God's not saying, don't be results-oriented. He's saying, the results will come. You're now plowing. You're, You're plowing right now, and it's hard work. The harvest will come, and I see it. I have many people here in Corinth that will respond to the message of my son Jesus. So don't stop. Stay, Paul. Plow and watch what happens. (laughs) Nobody likes plowing. (laughs) Anybody here like plowing? No, nobody likes plowing. Reaping is much more rewarding. (laughs) We all like to be the reapers. Paul listened to God, however. He gathered his courage. He stayed in Corinth and went back to plowing. Little did he know that the church at Corinth would become one of the largest of all of the churches he planted. And little did Paul know that Corinth would become a base for him, from which he would write many of his letters, including his biggest work, his letter to the Romans. I'm sure Paul looked back and he whispered a word of thanks to God for encouraging him to stay. Thanks, Lord. I didn't see that coming, but you did. He stayed and he continued to teach, both the Jew and non-Jew alike. Six months went by and he was still there. A year went by and he continued. A year and a half and he continues. His friendship with Aquila and Priscilla, it deepened. They ministered together and to each other. A year and a half goes by and they see a wonderful work blossom in Corinth. Light in the darkness, water for parched souls attempting to quench their thirst on the pleasures of the world. Come to Jesus and drink, rings a message in the city. Your desperate attempts to satisfy yourselves are understandable, but futile. Come give Jesus a try. You've tried everything else. Try faith in Christ. And many did. Many experienced God as they never thought possible. The church grew and grew and grew in numbers and influence, so much that the Jews that didn't join Paul, what happened? They grew jealous, (laughs) exactly. They grew jealous, and they sought to stop him. So while Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews of Corinth made a united attack on Paul and brought him to the place of judgment. This man, they charged, is persuading the people to worship God in ways contrary to the law. 
And just as Paul was about to speak, Gallio said to them, If you Jews were making a complaint about some misdemeanor or serious crime, it would be reasonable for me to listen to you. But since it involves questions about words and names in your own law, settle the matter yourselves. I will not be a judge of such things. So he drove them off. Then the crowd there turned on Sosthenes, the synagogue leader, and beat him in front of the proconsul. And Gallio showed no concern whatsoever. Hmm. So Paul had been there a long time. Crispus was no longer the synagogue leader. It was now Sosthenes. And poor Sosthenes gets a beating. Unlike the magistrates in Philippi and the politarchs in Thessalonica that we talked about last week, Gallio was smart and was not about to be played by one subculture, the Jews, in his city. He wasn't about to be played by them to do their bidding. You see, Gallio was the son of Seneca, the rhetorician. Many educated people were educated in rhetoric. You remember what a rhetorician is? right? A speaker whose words are primarily intended to impress or persuade. So Gallio's brother, Seneca the Younger, was a well-known Stoic philosopher. Gallio was also raised in the home of Lucius Junius Gallio, a famous rhetorician from where Gallio himself takes his name. And what Gallio's father, his stepfather Lucius and his brother had in rhetoric and philosophy, Gallio had in politics, in wit, and with charm. He saw through the scheme of the Jews and would not be used by them. At Gallio's judgment and dismissal, the Greek reads there, it says, remember where it says uh, at the end of the, the scripture that Gallio showed no concern whatsoever. It's like he didn't even care that they beat Sosthenes. But the Greek actually says that he paid no attention to the commotion rather than show no concern. The more accurate translation from the Greek should be, paid no attention to the commotion. So Gallio made his decision. He says, all right, get out of here. And then there was a commotion. But Gallio had moved on. At Gallio's judgment and dismissal, he just moved on. You see, there was many bigger issues. There were many bigger issues to deal with when running a capital city of a province. And he knew Roman laws very well. If anything happened that threatened his position or the stability of the city, he would deal with it. But he would not be used by individual groups for their own means. He was smarter than that. So the church grew. The church continued to grow and was blessed. Paul was blessed to see the work grow. How thankful he was that he didn't leave when he wanted to. You see, this new church, these were his children, and he was their pastor. Yes, there were lots of pastoral issues to deal with in Corinth. No other church caused him as many troubles as the church at Corinth did, pastorally speaking. But none also responded in kind to the message of Jesus Christ like the Corinthians did either. And what was that message? We looked at it last week. That gospel message. What was that gospel message that was turning the world upside down? That everything that we are looking for, our completeness, our satisfaction, our fulfillment, it's all done for us and is found in Jesus Christ. Last week, we read from Theodore Ferris, who reflects on Paul's missionary journeys. And he reminds us that the cross is something done for us. And this is the challenge of our message today. That our goodness, our life, our peace, our fulfillment is all done for us. It is accepted by faith. In Corinth, we have the quintessential examples of human response to our condition. You see, on one hand, we have the religious response displayed by the Jews. They say, we are the cure to our condition. We simply choose to do what we are supposed to do, 
in spite of our inner inclinations, in spite of our thoughts and feelings, we do what we believe is the right thing to do, to follow the law. This is self-righteousness. The life of the self-righteous leaves one always wanting, never fully alive, never completely honest with themselves, spending time and effort to portray oneself better than they really are. The life of the self-righteous never quite lives up to the standard set out for them or is always at risk of failing to meet it. It forces one to be judgmental and to compare oneself to others. So, on one hand in Corinth, we see the Jews, a self-righteous response to the human condition. Then on the other hand, we have the Corinthians, who throw morality out the window, and they rewrite religion to suit their own whims and desires. The fertility cults, the temple prostitutes, the promiscuity, the unbridled profiteering, indulgence of all kinds. This is the life of a Corinthian. And the life of the Corinthian looks fun, unshackled, free, expressive, and full of life. But ask a Corinthian, and they will tell you, yes, it is, for a while. But the frolicking indulgence quickly becomes a desperate attempt to numb and dry a thirsty soul. Yes, it's fun, but it doesn't quite scratch that itch. If this is all there is to life, life is shallow and empty. No earthly pleasure seems to complete our humanity as we believe it should, no matter how much we indulge. In fact, the more we indulge, the more acutely we realize it's not the answer. So what is? Along comes the message of Jesus Christ. And in all of the cities it arrives at, Corinth becomes a sponge. Time and time again, those who one would think would receive the message of salvation, the religious, the devout, those whose eyes are Godward, or at least religion word, those were the ones who rejected the message of Jesus. But the morally depraved, the indulgent, those who only used religion to fulfill their own physical desires, they drank up the salvation message. They took to faith. That God did something for us. This resonated with them. Perhaps because they had tried everything else without restraint. They were open to receive the message and to finally take that step of faith. Whereas the self-righteous, the good law-abiding people, were still determined to do it themselves. They would be the good people that they knew they should be. They could do it on their own. In our culture, we are told to be good people by our own effort, find our happiness, to achieve our fulfillment, to be at peace and find peace ourselves. It's something we achieve, something we create ourselves, but that is not the message of Christianity. The message of Christianity tells us all of that is already done for us. It is found and experienced by connecting with God through faith in Jesus Christ. It's not our effort. It's not something we achieve or create in our lives. It's already done for us and is found in Jesus Christ. Hmm. Who knew that Corinth would be fertile ground for this message? Paul learned a few things in Corinth. The first thing I think Paul learned was that just because he met with opposition in the synagogues didn't mean his pattern was wrong or ineffective. He was just frustrated. Although he shakes the dust from his cloak and says he will only go to the Gentiles, he calms down. 
The next city that he goes to after Corinth, do you know which city he goes to when he moves on from Corinth? Which city? <laughs> ah, you're right. <laughs> Ephesus. <laughs> well done. Well done, Franz. Yeah, after Corinth, he goes to Ephesus. The next city. And you know where he goes? To the synagogue. He goes to the synagogue. Well, he just said in Corinth, I'm done with you. I shake my cloak. I'm, I'm finished with you Jews. No, no. He calms down and he realizes my pattern is good. After Corinth, he goes to Ephesus where it says in Acts 18, 19, then he went to the synagogue. Paul learns that opposition does not mean a closed door. He learns that plowing is not a closed door, that God is working behind the scenes in the plowing. And then the second thing Paul learned was who belonged to God. Who would have thought that God had so many people who belonged to him? Remember, God says, Paul, keep speaking. Don't stop. I have many people in this city who belong to me. Hmm. It means those people who would respond to him in faith. That's what it means when God says, Paul, I have many people in this city that belong to me. Who would have thought that there would be such people in a city of renowned immorality? I'm sure upon arrival, Paul felt somewhat out of his element. Paul, a Jew of moral upbringing and moral religious standards, being an intellect, going to centers of learning and cities of advanced Roman culture, having just come from Athens, one of the greatest centers of learning in the known world of his day. He ends up in Corinth, the moral armpit of the Roman Empire. Corinth would not have been Paul's first pick to plant a church. He most certainly did not expect to see such a positive response to his message by the people of the city. God sees something in us that we don't. We tend to to judge each other by moral standards that have been created by laws written four, five, six thousand years ago. And we fail to see with the eyes of love. Until we see with the eyes of God, eyes of love, we will never see as we ought to. Paul learned that self-righteousness is an uglier demon to slay than indulgence and promiscuity. He learned that the love of God breaks through all moral barriers and rings louder than any earthly pleasure. He learned that God has people who belong to him in the most unlikely places. How many of those people do you think are here in Peterborough? Hmm? I'm not talking about Corinthians in particular. <laughs> I'm talking about people who will respond to God's message. Hundreds, thousands. Whenever I feel discouraged and think nobody will respond to the message of Jesus Christ, I just remember myself. I was a most unlikely candidate. I consider the Corinthians most unlikely candidates by Paul's standard. And may we learn to see with the eyes of God, see each other with love, and invite all to see that God has done something for us. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this story of Corinth. Corinth, a city that stood out. It was just different than the other cities. And yet the people there, unlikely candidates, they responded so well to your message. And Lord, may we not forget all of the Jews that did respond to you, like the leader of the synagogue in Corinth. So many of them did believe. Thank you for sending Priscilla and Aquila who became such great friends and encouragement to Paul and for speaking to Paul and encouraging him. Lord, use us here in Peterborough. We long to see you do the same kind of work here in our city as you continue to work in our own lives and hearts. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.